In 1964, Granada Television brought together a group of seven-year-olds. We have followed their lives every seven years, their dreams, ambitions, and fears for the future. Seven years older, seven years fatter, a bit less hair. You look at me at seven, and you look at me even now at 63. It's flown by, Michael. It's a lifelong achievement to be part of this program. Once you get to your 60s, it all gets a bit, oh, how long have we got now? <laughs> I certainly don't look forward to it every seven years. I suppose as you get a bit older, you've got less to lose. All these things that I've said over the years, yes, it has been worth it. And you better cut it, because otherwise I'm going to cry. A moment of pure joy in my life was when my son was handed to me when he was born. There's just no place for regrets in this world. Maybe one regret is probably would have liked more children. There are various things that I can do, they can't do. They can't change the light bulb. <laughs> but I can't get on Netflix. When we started at seven, most women were in the kitchen. Did you meet enough men before you decided who to marry? I thought that was actually an insulting question. You didn't have any idea of the changing role of women. And I want you to go, Rah! Children inherit something from their parents. Nobody wants to confess that they suffer mental ill health. I'm sitting here talking to you now. I'm squirming. <laughs> I want my life to have meant something. The sooner you understand who you are, the sooner you understand what you can do. <laughs> it's taken me virtually 60 years to understand who I am. I'm still the same little kid, really. Probably all of us are. Cheers! There's still plenty to do. It's not all over yet. Okay. I've got that now. You can there see he is. Now, yeah? yeah, well done. How are you? Pleasure to talk to you. Same. Let me close the door. Very, ex Very exciting. Easy I've come, easy go. He's gone. Down. Just as quick. Oh, there he is. Okay. I've turned. Now I'm here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Such a nice, what, how nice this is it to meet you. Hey, vice versa. Uh, how is it in New York? Good? Yeah, not bad. We're having a snowstorm. Uh, I don't know if you could see out there. Probably not. It's too much light. We had one on Sunday, and um, I went for a walk. We had one on Sunday. It was like a picture postcard. And uh, my granddaughter, who lives with us, we went to the forest area. And she took oh. a lovely photo. It was a beautiful setting. Beautiful. Do you get much snow? Yes, there was a lot of snow on Sunday and the weekend. And up north, it was uh, even worse. But um, down south here, it was quite terrific. Beautiful it was. It was yeah. Like a Christmas day. I've always come in the, I guess most of the time I've come in the summer my various trips to the UK and I've been all over. Okay. One of my favorite spots was the uh, the Lake District. I've never been to the Lake District. I um it's amazing embarrassed to say no I I understand all this but um it's funny it seems like being a London cabbie I pass Buckingham Palace and the Tower of London a hundred times a day and it's yeah. like a merry go I've never got off the merry go round to actually go in and see it myself. Understood. And it's madness. And, uh, yeah. you know. Meanwhile, we should tell people you've been to New York. When I went to New York, I, I went to Battery Park. I went to Statue of Liberty. I went up to the Empire State. I see the Chrysler building. There I say it. There I say it. Trump Tower. And I had a ball up there, you know. And uh, let's not forget Carnegie's Deli, which was I was one of the most favorite patrons there. With pastrami sandwich in there. Oh, right the overstuffed. They call them overstuffed sandwiches. You did, did, you, did you make it to Katz's Deli? No, I never went there. Good. Um, next Carnegie's was my favorite. Next, okay, next trip though. Do you remember <laughs> in Rob Reiner's movie When Harry Met Sally with Billy Crystal yeah. and Meg Ryan? And they sit down and they have sandwiches and she pretends to have an orgasm. Oh, is yeah. it? A woman at the next table says, when the waiter comes, she goes, I'll have what she's having. Yeah, I love it. But, um, that takes place at Katz's. That takes place at Katz's. In, yeah, in... I, and another beautiful restaurant, I went to Frankie and Johnny's. Okay. Like a steakhouse. You know where I'm on about? I remember that one, yeah. But the best thing I've done there, I've done a James Dean tribute. 
I went all around these old haunts where we uh, act in the actor studio. And from there, I went to West 68th Street up these apartments. And oh, wow. the guy who owns it, uh, a lovely a gentleman, uh, I knocked on the door and I went up these sort of like a, 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 a stairway. Spiral went stairway. Ran and ran to the top of the apartment. And I was actually in James Dean's apartment where, when in the 50s, is where he lived. And it was like a karma sort of come over me. And, and um, he said, come here, I'll show you something. And I went into the bathroom and there was this sink. It was still there after about a hundred years. And I washed my hand in the sink where James Dean washed, but it got better. When I went back home five years later, he modernized the bathroom and he sent the sink of James Dean's flat or like apartment to Indiana to be put into the James Dean Museum. Is that right? Is now. Yeah, and the, the best thing, the James Dean family sent him back an original James Dean t-shirt, but uh, it had Quakers, Fairman Quaker. And um, this guy, he said, you can try it on. And I tried it on and I, you know, I've got James Dean's t-shirt on. And I tell you, it was like, um, oh, I don't know. It was like a vision, you know. And well, and who was the guy that was arranging all this? And whose apartment was it? It was who was living there? Uh, I've got is that Russell Russell okay. Morrison or Russell? Guy how did Russell. you meet him? How did you meet him? I just went up to the. I, I looked up. All, I read all about James Dean. I'm a, I'm an authority on James Dean. You're I know fanatic. It's silly, fanatic. And um, I looked it all up, and there it was, West 68th Street. I was number 19. I, I looked at the block. I found the block. I went in. Uh, hello. I said, I'm Tony from London. He said, eh, press the buzzer. I went up the stairs and there it was. And it had the round portal windows exactly how the film portrays it. And all the pictures of the 50s, you know, of James Dean's. It was, for me, it was fantastic. And there was a, one thing I'll never, ever forget, but it was fantastic. Loved it. Wow. Who would have thought that that was your guy, huh? Yeah, but it, uh, no, no, I'm listening up. Were you it like me, a rebel without a clue? A rebel without a clue. Do you know something? You might think I'm mad. I'm not mad, but um, I know you're not. I'm, I'm an obsessive. Once I get a sort of thing in my head, it becomes an obsession. John F. Kennedy is the same. You know, I recite all his speeches and I can recite in my head now his inauguration speech of 1961, January the 20th. And I can recite every word of it. Even now, if I recite it, I could go on and on, but <clears throat> it sounds now, so All silly. I know is ask not what you, what your country can do for no, you, but no. rather, rather what you can do for your country. Yeah, no. <clears throat> That's all I know. Great quotations are, it's not a thorn in the flesh, but a dagger in the heart. We a... stand today on the edge of a new frontier. That I could go on. I'll do a little bit of acting, as you obviously know, but um, well, yeah, and then you know, he was. I was born two months before he was assassinated, so I I was a Kennedy baby. I I'm very proud that I was born just two months before Lyndon Johnson took uh, the White House. This story I'm going to tell you, you won't believe me, but it's true, and I will tell you. Yeah, I, I, I do believe, and I've got my. Well, my I believe you. Here. Uh, I'm I driving wobbly. along. In, I drove along by. Um, Claridge's hotel and a hand goes up and hailing me down in my taxi cab. Who gets in was a guy and his wife. Take me to uh, the, uh, the Hilton or somewhere important. I was going through a big bath, a big do. I said, jump in. And he starts talking like that. And, uh, you know, I said, are you from Boston? He said, yes. I said, oh, I said, my hero was from there, Boston, Massachusetts. He said, JF, I said, JFK. He said, well, I'm Sergeant Shriver's son. Oh, my gosh. On Maria's my brother? On my mother's grave. The Maria's brother. Arnold's brother-in-law. Yeah. So I says to him, you're joking, because he had the square chin, the chiseled chin, you know? And he spoke in a very Bostonian accent, that type of thing. Yeah. And I picked up, I picked my ear, picked up on it. And there we were. And I recited some of the speech to him. 
he was very good, very gracious, very thankful. His wife shook my hand and um, so he says to me, because I wanted to go to Iannis Port one day, that would be a, 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 a buzz for me yeah, if I course. went there. I understand. Just to get a feel. Like, sure, you know, yeah. These are your like heroes. I had yeah. to put on a coat and they sort of feel the characteristics. That's exactly how I felt doing that to him. And it was a fantastic moment, which I cherish. Well, um, what was the name of the street that the Kennedys lived on in the Boston area? Do you remember? No, I don't know that. I'm, okay, I believe I'm, it because I lived in Brookline for a couple of years. I lived in Boston back in the 1980s. Yeah. And um, I believe it was Beale, Beale, Beale Street. Of course, Beale Street. Beal. There's another famous Beale Street that's the main drag in Memphis, but that's, that's, this is, I believe in Brookline that the Kennedys may have lived there. We'll have to check, check that out. But, because I remember living just around the, like a block away, and I heard that that was the street, but my memory could be playing tricks on me. But but I know it sounds silly. When I was a kid of eight years old in 63, he got assassinated, and uh, on the Monday morning going back into school, it was uh, primary, like your, your first grade, you would call it. And um, I was only eight years old, and it's very vivid in my memory. But a month afterwards is when Michael Acted came to our classroom and chose the ch kids from the film, you know, from my part of the woods, right. to represent the East End, because I'm an East End boy from Bethnal Green. And uh, then the cameras came, and from there... They filmed us all uh, at a party in a adventure playground in the movie house because sure. it was uh, Saturday morning pictures. Then we call it pictures, you call it movies. But every every Saturday morning, we had Saturday morning pictures where the kids used to go for a dime. I'm going to have American uh, slogans right. here. Because... And a couple of uh, a couple of uh, what would you call it? Uh, uh, pens. pens well, in, Penny, in yeah, pennies. No, but in your in 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 uh, London, or rather in England, you'd you'd say for a couple of uh, pence, pence? Or... couple of quid. Quid, of course. No, a quid, a quid is a pound, a buck. In your oh, okay, well, that's too much so, then. Right. So if I start giving you some a slang, because we have Cockney rhyming slang. I know. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if I go, um, yeah. If I go. Uh, a front no, I won't say that one. But you can squid. say anything. Don't worry about no, it. No, I won't. If I say a squid, it means a quid. I got you. You know. Yep. And I've heard about. I mean, I've heard about cocky. On. I've heard about cocky oh. slang, and I've heard people explain it. So I, I was. I'm, I'm familiar, but I couldn't do it. But I, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Well, I'm um, like how again, you get nicknames and stuff like that. Yeah. I am a cockney, so if I start at the top, is your barnet fair? Your boat races your face, your mitts buys your eyes, your farmer's owes is your nose, your dicky dirt is your shirt, your round the houses are your trousers, your four by twos are your shoes, and your tomfoolery is your jewelry. It's it fantastic. can go on and on and on, but I mean. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's what a good. Great, what a great. Idea. So you're an American, American file. You're a. I don't know what the proper term. Like here, we have Anglophile for you, like someone like me who loves the UK. But um, you have the, am, you have the exact opposite. Where you, I am a, I, I am a proud, America. I'm a proud Cockney, and a Cockney is a person born in the sound of Bow Bells, Marley Bow Church in Cheapside, where once they ring them bells, providing you're in a hospital nearby or anywhere in that area. Providing you can hear them, you are des you know known as a cockney. Oh, very. What's the name of the bells? Bow bells. Okay. Bow. B O W. Got you. Got you. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I'm. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. this. I'm. It's. It's like a masterclass from Tony Walker. Well, I mean, I am an original without being conceited. I mean, you know, a, a proper New Yorker you know, make a wife on the next block, you know, one of them. They know everything about their own neighborhood. That's me. They know That's everyone who lives there. And, sure. you know, it's no less than the same. It's reciprocated this side of the Yeah, but, you know, well. somebody like you probably te can teach a lot of New Yorkers more of their history than they know. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's fun, as, as I alluded to earlier. It's, it is like a merry-go-round. I, I would go and see the sights in New York, and I'll take for granted the sights in London that I've never been. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. sure, sure. you know, I'm, it, it's one of them things. So American history, I like the, the Kennedy administration from the beginning to the his end of term, you know, since he, he, he got killed. And all that I like. I like the civil rights. I love the Bay of Peaks. I love the Cuban Missile Crisis. And all what he achieved, you know, with Martin Luther King, you know, for the civil rights movement at that particular time. For me, you know, to read back on that history, it's a fantastic read, you know? Do you feel like, Tony, do you feel like if Michael hadn't chosen you or if that you had not been in the Up Series project, that you would still have ended up with the same uh, obsessions and the same curiosity? Would you have been the same person? Exactly, a carbon copy. You could get my character in a mold and put it down on one side, whether Michael was there or not, and mold it and come back to me now, it would have been the same mold as I would be then, the same. Because it's nature and nurture. You sort of born with what you've got. I took after my mum and the characteristics, the environment where I brought up, all the boys and the girls, all the same. There was poverty. There was, a, um, you know, no work. My father was absent. He was in prison most of the time. He was like a flim flam man, you know, playing the free card trick. My mum was always in the pub and I was left for my own devices. That doesn't mean that I don't love my mum and dad. I didn't mean it in that respect. I understand. It was an, it, I had a freedom that it was an education. By the time I was four or five, I had a job working in a fruit shop, you know, trying to help, her, you know, stack the shelves and things like that. I was no bigger than three foot six. And they used to pay me about 5p, which is a dime or a quarter, you know, whatever it the same sort of monetary is and uh, it was a grounding for me and when the fun fair came in the local park i was nine or ten or seven and i used to go over there with about four of us everyone was the same mm -hmm. we just had adventure but you couldn't do it now because of the um the politically correctness or the, the environment you know you have labor laws etc sure yeah but health and safety one I guess you know the 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 that I don't know if it was arrived at just through arbitrary you know circumstances, but the seven years was maybe enough in between each episode of the series might have been the right amount because it was if it was too close together, uh, you would never well, really be able to extract your life would have always been tied too closely to the no, series, the production. I, I understand, but you must understand the social change. When it first started, you had fashion, you had Mary Quant, you had Twiggy, the music, you had the Beatles, you had the Rolling Stones, politics, you had the Perfumo scandal, you had Swinging London. Yeah, and, and that was that. Now, seven years on, we joined the common market. And then from there, you know, things happened. Then you had um, the Queen's Jubilee in 77. So it went on and on and on. Then families are brought in. And then once the families are brought in and then you see the, the spouses and everyone, it becomes like, um, not a series, but you know, it's, oh, you know, I wonder how they're getting on. And when you see how old the kids are in the next one, you think, oh, I remember that kid. In the, not me, I'm talking about the, you know, the subject's children. And, and you remember it. And you see the change in them. I mean, you know. Right. It seems to have caught the imagination of the old world. And um, yeah. through Michael's acted uh, talents, uh, loyalty to all the subjects, and the trust that he put into the program, it's a testament to what he'd done. He's the only man in the whole wide world who ever done anything and achieved this longevity in a documentary film. And um, he gave his whole life to it, even before feature films. I mean, if you look at Coal Miner's Daughter, he championed women's causes a lot. Coal Miner's Daughter with uh, um, Sissy Spack. 
you had Nell with uh, Jodie Foster, Diane Fossey and Willis in the Mist with Sigourney Weaver. That's right. Champion women all the time. That's right. Then he went on from an elevate to The World Is Not Enough with um, Piers Brosnan and James Bond. Then you had Narnia, the franchise of Narnia. He was director there. Yeah. And um, he's been going in his first reach since 1970 on the Triple Echo with Glenda Jackson and Oliver Reed, which was his first one. Right. And from it's now two twenty, so that's fifty years in in cinema, you know, history. And he was at the front with the beginning of it all. He was a troubleshooter. He was like the first one. I can honestly say I only wish he got more recognition than he did. Then he became. Oh, you feel he became um, a director of the Hollywood Directors Guild, chairman. He achieved so much. For three years, he was on the, the chairmanship of the Hollywood Directors Guild. It, you know, it's a testament to Michael's talents, his trust, his loyalty sure. to, to everyone. And there's not one person I would know about Michael who had, had anything bad to say about him. He was my inspiration to me, and I get very emotional now since he's passing 10 yeah. days ago or so. But Well, that's, I why, say, and that's why I feel particularly grateful to you to uh, be open to meeting me who you, you, you know, I'm a stranger. I know we talked on the phone uh, the other night, but uh, you know, to open up and to, to, to share your memories and, and uh, your feelings about him. It, thank you for that. Cause uh, you know, he, yeah, you know, you, I know how you much you understand. I, I'm not a full blown actor like Piers Brosnan or uh, Gene Hackman or you Grant, all these people who he's worked for, Tommy Lee Jones, ask any of them A-listers. Tell me about Michael Acton, Dustin Hoffman. They would only tell you what a gentleman the man was and what a talent he was and how appreciative he had more of you than you had of him being to you, reciprocate. I love the man and uh, a shining light went out in Hollywood last week. And uh, it yeah. had to do with Michael's passing. God bless him. Well, we talked about a little bit about what you, you know, the last installment was 63. And I knew that, you know, he's an older guy. I had heard some talk that maybe he wasn't well, but I didn't know how unwell. Because uh, I met him toward the end of 2019. Well, I met him actually in 2000, I guess in 12. But then I saw him more, most recently in 2000. 2019, the fall, uh, <clears throat> when 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 63 up came to uh, the states, and you know I sat with him. And by the way, I just got the photos because the publicist never said he took some photos of, of Michael and I. And I at the time I was asking for them, he never sent them. And then when Michael died, I I and I knew I was going to talk to you. I I I asked him again. I thought, let me see if he's can find them maybe to delete them and sure enough he he sent me all these photos there were a lot more than i remember i'll, I'll show them to you later but oh. um i was hoping that he would make it to 70 you know that was my hope that he would 70 well, seemed like like the right number to go out yeah. and you know um it's not, I, agree and with you. I was rooting for him to be able to make it and you know i, I mean 70 up will still have to get made but by others. It does have a good ring to it, but um, all's not lost. You just don't know what happens to powers that be. And um, we've got a young lady, Claire Lewis, who uh, has been there for nearly 40 years. You must understand it's the same production team. They've been there now for nearly 40 years together. You've got the cameraman, George Jesse Turner, who has done groundbreaking documentaries. That's it, all right. You've got Nick Steer, the sound man. You've got Kim Halton, the editor. And you've got Claire Lewis, who's now what I would consider carrying the torch okay. for, for the up series to be concluded. Because it does have a good ring to it, seven to 70. And uh, a round figure of 10, you know, that probably yeah. would be the final one. But it's a testament to Michael. And uh, I'd just like to add, um, on Thursday evening, they're going to rerun all the old series on the TV of 63 Up. Right. And um, they've found three-week slots. So it's one, 
two three on three weeks one hour each week no well, um, i hope that we do a big i i would think that the that at some point soon that we're going to do something huge here in the united states because I believe that you know there's an enormous amount of love and respect for Michael for what he accomplished with that series. They should show the entire series at Lincoln Center. Well, apparently it's on Blu-ray. That's what I've been told. And they should fly Tony Walker out and a few of the other cast members. I would listen. I would. They should fly you out. I've been to the Lincoln Memorial a couple of times to talk about. This is it. not the memorial. This is Lincoln Center, where you know the the, the, yeah. the center for a real. All the arts. I well, mean, that, well like, I went there. With, I went. I was on the stage there with Michael about uh, fourteen years or seven years ago, promoting it there. And uh, also, I went to California with um, a lovely invitation from Simon McMurray, who does all the um, oh, I know documentary out sure. in California. And uh, Kill Simon Murray. Simon Kill Murray. Kill Murray. Kill Murray. He's a, a he's a good friend of mine. He's a good friend. Gentleman, an yeah. absolute gentleman. He ran POV and, uh, for many years. He was like the hands-on. I mean, well, he was that, POV, and, um, our series. That yeah. gentleman, he invited me out to California with my family to promote the show with uh, Michael right. on stage on the Beverly Hilton Hotel, which was quite good. But I must tell you the best story that I've got was last year before the 23rd of March, before it all went down with this Corona-19. Michael was itching to get back to California and he only had a little amount of time to get a flight to go back. Oh, right. And um, he had a, an award ceremony, which he could not attend. And where the corona was just about to be, you know, we're going to get the rules to sort of don't go or can we go. There was about a, a, a three or four day window where you can go. And in the three or four day window, there was this award. So Michael phoned up Claire Lewis, the producer, who said she can't make it. Michael said, get Tony to go and get it for me and let him, I'm getting emotional now. But I accepted the award on Michael's behalf and I got very emotional. But um, I've still got his award now. It's in my bedroom and I'm waiting for the right time to give it to one of his family members where it should go and well-deserved. And um, for him to ask me inadvertently was one of my proudest days because listen at the end of the day I'm just a lemon cabbie trying to climb my way up in the acting world which you know it's a very difficult thing and it's not a pun to get on or anything like that I'm just giving an example of my character but to be asked to do that it was quite emotional for me and most of all I felt so proud getting on the stage and accepting the award and giving the speech to what he told me to recite, which I will take to my grave. Yeah. I really felt proud. Well, what a sign of trust. Oh, you cannot believe it. I mean, it's not only the trust. You must understand, there's 14 subjects on the, the Up series. That's without the spouses' names now, who have been sort of introduced over the course of the years. Not only does he know the names of all the subjects and the spouses and the wives, right? He knows all the children's names. As plus he knows all the grandchildren's names in my case. Now, for a man who would not, not care, no man would do that over a 50 year longevity of a documentary. The man put his heart and soul in that project. And it's a testament to all the families of the trust that Michael, that we had in Michael. And uh, I'd ring the bell for his praises every time. He meant the world to me, Michael. And um, sadly, we won't see his like again because the times of the times he was in the 60s, we are now in uh, two, 2021. It's nearly, it's 50, 50 odd years of history there. And if you look back in history of 50 years, so much has gone on, you know. So much has gone on in one year, let alone 50. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I won't, I'm not going to mention anything what's going on in America because it's too sensitive. No, it's not. Not I, no, I no, wish we're, you guys feeling, luck. we're feeling less sensitive. Uh, 
I just read actually yesterday that Kenneth Bragg, who was on my podcast, yes, your is going to play Bojo. Can I call him Bojo? Well, I pick I pick Boris Johnson up. Did Before you? Before he, when he was mayor of London about eight years ago, he came out of Downing Street wearing a big um, uh, like a hood, and all I see is a bit of flickering of uh, right. the, the hair, and the Thank hair you. went up. He said. Could you take me to the Ritz, please? I said, oh, I said, Boris, how are you? Well, the cab drivers at that time, we had a very adversity going on with him. And he got into the right cab with me because we've had certain demonstrations and whatever, all down to his uh, decisions, what he's made on the cab trade at that beginning. He helped to get Uber's license at that particular time. And he rang the bell for Uber with Cameron and uh, Osborne, the own secretary at the time. No, the... Yeah, the Home Secretary, yeah. And uh, Cameron was Prime Minister. So between the three of them, they sort of implemented the Uber licence. And I was sort of very objective to him. Sure. He, still owes, he still owes me 80 pence. Right. Oh, yes. I remember you mentioned. And that's a true story. He owes me 80p. Only, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I'm sure any uh, average person would never, you know, get away with such a thing. But, but the prime minister, of course. But it's true. You cannot believe when you drive. I've been driving 43 years. I've got so many lovely stories concerning Michael. When I first came to New York 25 years ago, my wife gave me it as a birthday present because I always wanted to go to New York. And I'm walking along down Madison Avenue one day. And Michael Apt had just directed Dustin Hoffman in Agatha. Oh, okay. I was, I was trying to remember. And Dustin Hoffman was walking towards me about 100 yards. And I'm walking towards him. Now the yardage is getting 20, 30, you know, getting less and less. He comes right up to my elbow and I shot man. I said, Mr. Hoffman. And he looked and I grabbed his hand. I said, um, um, I said Michael Acton was a good friend of mine that, He's just directed you in Agatha. That was the first words. He said, I'm going to lunch now. I said, but Dustin, I said, said, but I want to talk to you. He goes, I'm walking here. No, he said, I'm going to lunch now. I said, please, listen, just just let me have a photo. And I got a photo on my phone. And uh, I have. Yeah, go ahead. Go on, you first. Oh, I was just going to say, I have, I met him when I was a kid and I have his, his signature, his autograph. But Fantastic. No photo. But it, but it goes on from there because. But his son was on my podcast. Jake Hoffman did my podcast. Well, I cannot believe it. It was a connection, and yep. also, I picked Sigourney Weaver up from the theater. Another we another were, connection, right? And she was very um, invisible with all that. She was trying to be incognito. Right. Yeah, she I was traveling Sigourney incognito. Weaver. Yeah. I said. Sigourney, pleasure to meet you. Welcome to London. Well, she couldn't believe it. She said, oh, I thought you wouldn't have recognised me. I said, well, I said, well, me and you have got a lot in common and you don't know it. And she stood <laughs> back and she never knew. And I says, um, Michael Acton directed you in Grillers in the Mist. That's right. And he had me in Seven Up. Well, you, you would think the, the old shroud came off and everything. And she invited me into um, Cabbages with her and her partner. Wow. And we had a five, ten minute chat. You look like Kenneth Branagh, by the way. You don't look unlike him. Like who? Kenneth Branagh, you look like Oh, him. yeah, yeah. Well, I get that. <laughs> I, I, I get that. I have to send you also a photo of me and Kenneth uh, because I, w- I was, especially one of my uh, exes in the line of exes that I have, that what she kept telling me she was watching that series uh, on uh, Netflix, you know, the, 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 the uh, Scandinavian series where he plays a, you know, a detective. You know what I'm talking about? I'm trying to remember. I've not seen it. Oh, uh, well. The last time I... Go on. You first. No, I just, she kept saying, you know, did anybody tell you? A lot of people had, I mean, I, I've gained like 10, 20 pounds being in co- uh, quarantine, but, the, you know, I would get it all the time. You look like Kenneth. Did anybody ever tell you? I said, yes, yes, I get it. So when I met him, and I, you should listen to the episode because he, he it's thought the that was... eyeline as well, your eyes. Yeah. I know, no, no, I know there is a, uh, a little bit of a resemblance. Last year, I went to see Kenneth Brown in The Entertainer. 
right? No. At the, in Charing Cross there. Sure. In the, the Wyndham's, I think. Um, one of the greatest actors of today, without question. The man is a genius, another yeah. genius. Yeah, and now he's going to play actor. Boris Johnson. You mean he's going to play Boris Johnson? Let's he's going to play Boris Granner. Johnson. Let's hope if I meet Granner and he's dressed up as Boris Johnson, he pays me the 80 videos, me. <laughs> so is is uh, is Boris Johnson then, I guess, the most famous person who you ever uh, drove? I mean, supporting no, you no, here we go. You want to know I've had in my cab? 43 years worth of driving, yeah? I'm sure there's... In, in, in London, let's tell people, so you're in one of the capitals of the world. All right. Johnny Depp. Telly Savalas twice. Telly Savalas. Twice. Arthur Hash, twice. tennis player. Yeah. Who? Telly Savalas. Telly Savalas twice. Right. Yeah. That's in in the deep. early 80s. Arthur Ash, the tennis player. Oh, of course. Sure. He, he gave me two sentences tickets for Wimbledon, Arthur Ash. I went on my own, I, I sold a bunch of a scalper, and I went in there, and, I, and that's a true story. Uh, Johnny Depp I picked up three years ago, Johnny Depp. Yeah. Uh, right, um, Shirley MacLaine. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the, uh, who's in the film um, Wimbledon? Who was in the film Wimbledon? Uh, Johansson. Scarlett Johansson. Oh, Scarlett Johansson, sure. All right, you you yeah. won't believe these. I've had was that during Match when she shot Match or one of those yeah. Leon movies? Yeah, with Woody Allen. That's it. With Woody Allen directed. Yeah. And um, I could go on, but um, let's not forget um, Buzz Aldrin, the spaceman. Wow. And um, I've got the story to prove it to say um, when he was going to Winfield Ass, I think Obama was at the time. Mm -hmm. He was going from the Grosvenor House with his um, minder or protector to meet the president. And as I drove out the forecourt, I heard a word say, get his autograph. And I turned to Buzz Aldrin. I said, Mr. Aldrin, can I have your autograph, please? And the cab driver said, no, 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 I don't want his autograph. I want your autograph. My wife loves you. And that's what she, she said. That's a true story. I believe I'm it. Well, I was... That's what I'm I was going to say. In these stories, but these I know. Stories. Well, I was going to say, I, 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 I don't think you, I don't know if you, if you're aware, just like what you, uh, mean to so many people who have been watching those, like myself. When I say people, I mean me. Like you know, who have been watching Michael's films all these years, and you know that the first one, the first installment that came to the states was Twenty Eight Up. That was in Bleecker um, Street. That's right, the Bleecker Street yeah. Cinema, which isn't there anymore. Don't look for it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and but I went with my cousin. I remember the whole. I remember the going there, just being blown away. I'm like, wow, what? You know, never heard of this series. I, I must have read about it, and it was you know there was so much great stuff coming from England. Mm -hmm. We would get in New York. You know, it's just that's how well, that's how I you know discovered Stephen Frears and Mike Lee and. You know, I'm just talking about contemporaries. I'm, you know, for I, the, I mean, the you know, England has some of the greatest filmmakers of all time. But Guy just Ritchie. in terms of when I, what? Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie, more contemporary, even more contemporary. Alan Parker. Uh, Alan Parker, of course. There's, there's. I mean, you can go on and on. There's, there's, but, um. But at this particular time, these films were just starting to come in, like Stephen Freer's films, you know, his early, you know, some of his early films. And we were starting to get, and, uh, you know, My Beautiful Laundrette, and uh, when uh, Sam, was Sammy Rosie Get Laid or whatever it was, I forget all these films that were coming in. And uh, uh, so, and then amongst that whole time, we, we got in this documentary, 28 Up, so I went to see it you know, and just was like blown away. So ever since then, I've seen every installment. For years, I just go to the films to see them in the theaters, but I think probably the last couple I saw. Uh, well, well, it has caught the imagination of the whole world from New Zealand, Australia, Asia, all the way around to America, Canada, uh -huh. to all the countries. And often, I often go to students, to a college or to a school, 
and I'll get up and talk about the program and try to give them some uh, inspiration to yeah. say, you know, not that I've done anything better than anyone else, far from it, but just to let them know that rather than be go on the, the wrong road, always go to the education, love your mum and dad, try and get a job, be the right sort of good citizen and try to inspire yourself to inspire others. And from there, just to give them a little bit of inspiration that I do tell them and they see me and they talk to me and I've had many letters saying, Tony, you, you know, you was a kid and you really liked the opportunity that you had and I'll try to follow in your footsteps. There's a woman in Ireland and there's a woman who I speak to one of my fans and she's the fans who watch me fan now. I'm a cabby for God's sake, yeah? Well, you're also she a... named She named her son Tony after me. <laughs> <laughs> and he named his son Tony after me, and that's now a grandson. Can you believe that one? That's amazing. And it goes on from there. Right. And um, well, it's, I like the attention. I don't doubt that. And I won't, you know, shy away from that. And you've but been a great ambassador. I, that's what I love to be. I would love to carry the torch for the program, which I do. I am very passionate about the program. I'm in a very, very unique position, being only chosen from 14 people in the whole wide world to be part of the longevity of 50 odd years. It's now 56 years, yeah. but they have done a seven up in Russia. They've done one in um, um, Australia. They, uh, they, Michael always used to say he should have done one in South Africa or one in Northern Ireland, because you know, with the situations what was happening back then, it would have, really caught the imagination of the world. But um, this is the first, and we're so many years now in front of any other documentation. But and document that we are the, the forefront. That, um, yeah, I mean, you can catch, how many times can you catch lightning in a bottle? You know, I mean, it's, the, I mean, we tried to hear too, as you know, and it just didn't, didn't catch on. Well, Roger Eber, God bless him, when he was being interviewed with Michael, well, he was interviewing Michael, I should say. He always says to Michael, the Up series was one of my test 10 best films of all time. It's on here. Oh, is that what he says there? It says, it says it right on, it says it right here. It says, yeah. well, uh, one, one on my list of the 10 greatest films of all time, Roger Ebert. Right. So what can't speak can't lie. And uh, Roger Ebert, you can't, you can't find me exactly. Oh, that? Yeah. yeah, that's when I had a little bit of a... It doesn't even look like you. Bro. you. It looks like a, like a young Rod Steiger or somebody. That doesn't look like you. You know, and that, I've just watched it in the heat of the night with Rod Steiger. And, uh, I love that movie. Body, uh, what a film. Isn't what that one of the best? Film. You know who I've talked to? Do you know who I talked to? They, uh, I, I'd rather Lee Grant. Lee Grant, now go back to Lee Grant. I mean, know her history. Did she not go from, was it the McCarthy period with the communism? That's right, the, that's right. The yes. yes, as a matter and, of fact, um, let me just show you this, Tony. Uh, it, since it's right by my... See, oh, and, well, let me see. Lee Grant, I saw her in the Columbo recently. I, uh, are you lucky devil? Well, she did my she show. She must be about 85 now. No, no. Lower? In her 90s. No. Yeah. She was the one of the most beautifulest girls I've ever seen. She was. When, Shampoo. In the heat of the night, when she played um, the, 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 the widow in there, the one who got killed. Uh, and don't forget, um, she was in Colombo. Uh, I see her in there. Oh, but sure. Then, um, she also got... Um, but she was in Shampoo uh, with Warren Beatty. Uh, well, <laughs> that's correct. But what a beautiful woman. What a beautiful she was. woman. And she was beautiful when I sat across the table from her about two years ago, if that. I don't even think it was that long ago. And she walked into the room like a 25-year-old woman. I'm not kidding. I don't know how lovely, she did it. She's, lovely. she's in such good shape. Do you ever see her now? Well, I saw her one more time. Um, they were showing, you know, she she actually directed a bunch of documentaries too. Marvelous. 
they were Will you give it up? about she and she, she they showed them at a cinema down in New York um, last year and I it must have been just weeks or months before this all happened maybe a little before that but not much and um, she was there so I got to see her again so t- on two occasions um, you know I, I know her like people that are close to her so I have uh, and you know you do what I do long enough and you just you know, you just like you pick up the phone kind of thing, you know, or you write them. And most of the time you hear back. Uh, I, have you know, uh, I have the track record now where, you know, I can uh, people take me seriously, you know, uh, and they can see work I've done. They can check it out. And then they're like, oh, this guy, he really gets into real conversations. It's not superficial. He yeah, actually does his homework. This, this, you know, it's, this, this is certainly not superficial. And uh Nothing's planned or nothing. It would be I'm, fun I'm to just not be superficial you. with you too, but <laughs> we would no, have, but you know, it, have a couple it, of points. Listen, the way I've always seen interviews, the mendacity of certain uh, interviewees, you can see right through it, you know, because when a celebrity goes on, I don't want you to talk about this, I don't want to talk about that, you know, and they keep scrubbing off what they want and whatever the, uh, you know, things they're going to say. But I say it myself, listen, if you're going to be an actor, you're up there to be candid, you put yourself out there, you've got to take the gruff with the smooth, you know? Nobody's perfect, and I've yet to find a person who is. Well, oh, one asked... person, one person. To me, that was my mother. Oh. That was, um... she was perfect. <laughs> she was perfect. Mine too. Um, well, I just asked Lee, I, you know, because we got very close, very very intense and I said look you know do you forgive Elias uh do you forget uh you know uh Ilya Kazan Ilya Kazan thank you I just well let me go tripping over my time I said he named names and she didn't name names you were right she was brought in front of the committee yeah uh, you know the McCarthy uh, McCarthy yeah well there was a Hollywood version of that you know and they They insisted she name names and she refused and she lost work for a bunch of years. All and, of her and, ingenue yeah. years were lost. Right. If you and, go back to Elia Kazan, when they gave him an honorary um, Academy Award, sure, and you, had, uh, and, Scor- and you had Scorsese up there with him and Robert De Niro, half booed, half clapped. Right. Now, he was at a rock and a hard place because if you look at Elia Kazan on the waterfront, James Dean, East of Eden, was it Baby Doll with uh, Carol Baker? You know, and oh well, uh, uh, the, no, the, he he's undeniably changed film the film. Of course, the method. Uh, uh, no, he 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 is ge- one of the you know the term genius is thrown around too frequently, but he he truly was a visionary. But he also, I mean, I read again. I could reach for another book. I read his yeah. book. You know. And I was hoping there would be some sort of rationale or, you know, like we're getting into this conversation, but uh, where he might explain his, and he just dug his heels, you know, he, and I said to Lee, I said, you know, we're, what do you think? Because I understand there was a no, they were, people like Ilya Kazan were in a no win position. That's what I'm saying. What kind of they, they were, yeah, exactly. But you chose not to name names, talking to Lee. And yeah. you paid the consequences. Other people collaborated, or yeah, uh, you know, or or the beans. and they got they could like Eli Kazan were uh, able to continue working. And I, if we say that they're also victims, and I can't bring my people that listen to my show probably are annoyed because I bring this up. So it's one of my. You're, you just started our conversation talking about your obsessions and your things that preoccupy yeah, you, that was like your... Kennedy, like Bay of yeah. Pigs, like yeah. the civil rights movement. Those yeah. things interest me too, but the, 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 red, you know, the red Scare is one of my big ones, and I, I read a lot about it. And, uh, can, I, so, can I give you a story before we... we sure, yeah, please. Of course. Michael We're here to acted, talk to you. That when, my, when Ilya Kazan was on his deathbed, yeah. And he had a week or two to live. Michael Acted, who was the director of the Directors Guild, then chairman, he went to visit Ilya Kazan on his deathbed. Oh my, I didn't know this story. And uh, they were just talking about various things. And he, Michael was just trying to, 
you know, give him some kind words and whatever. And uh, he, he told me that story. I wonder if, I'm, do you sure. think that Kazan was, was at peace? Uh, did well, Michael ever say anything about that? It was different times then. It was the 50s. You see what I'm saying? You know, well, was, you, you yeah. saw, you only, the you only saw 15, 15 years after the war. So like, you know, 45 to 55, 10 years, 12 years or whatever. It's, it's, it was all what I would call, I don't know. It was one of them things. You mentioned reds under the beds, you know, or communism in them particular days. Very sensitive issue. Very, very sensitive. Then McCarthy then pulled it up and he thinks, let's go get these bastards. That's what he's thinking in his head. But, you know, it never materialized because people are damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. So, also, when they know, saw where communism ended up, you know, Stalinist Russia, these types of, you know, leaders, a lot of people left the party or, you know, the party or the party changed and a lot of people were disappointed and left. So, you know, people have common sense, you know, well, uh, they, have, they maybe have a different ideology than you do. But at the end of the day, and I'm not talking about these nut jobs who stormed our capital two weeks or three weeks ago, but, you know, <laughs> Do you think the Cold War has softened now? Or do you think the communist decision uh, is softened in preference to sort of like, say, even 70s or the 80s when the wall came down? Or, you know, have they become more unified? Or would you say there's still a distant, you know... Between between struggle? the states and, the, and Russia? Yeah, no, yeah, the state, yeah, the east and the west. The, yeah. I, I think there is a kind of a Cold War, but, you know, it's kind of different now where... It's about, you know, I mean, look, this president, Putin is, you know, he's, 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 he's a, he's a, just a mobster. I mean, he's like, you know, um, and well, I think, a, lot, a lot of people have got rich with, with the oil after it all went and saw it independent and everyone sort of ran for cover and they took the money, you know, that's how I see it, you know, but um, like everything else, you can have it in your head, but you can't say too much. Right. Yeah. Well, um, but just to finish that anecdote with Lee, she 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 said she, because I said, do you forgive? I mean, what what do you feel like? You know, and she she said he did try to apologize. Well, talk to her, I should say. Kazan tried to, you know, contact her many many years ago, obviously, and she wouldn't talk to him. But now she says she forgives him. She says, you know, it's one of those classic things. I, I forgive him. I don't forget what he did, but I forgive him. And I understand I had to let when, him know. When um, Rod Steiger got the part in On the Waterfront, he took that part, you know, Big Charlie, you should have looked at it. I remember very well because... Right. Uh, that so scene, as you know, is the iconic. When he left the set, he had to do it and improvise on his own in the back seat of that car. Did you know that, Rod Steiger? And l years later, he got he found out about Ilya Kazan's sympathies. What? Happened oh yeah, yes, of course, that. yeah. And he said if he would have known then, he wouldn't have accepted the part. That's well, what he said. Well, that's right. And then he went back. He tried to hire. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he tried to uh, work. He wanted to work with. Uh, I'm trying to remember the uh, the circumstances. I thought maybe they, you know, Mark, they contacted Brando for another project, and he refused at that point because. Well, that's it. But I mean. But I, I I can't remember everything clearly at the moment. You know, one of my pet hates, and it, to please or offend, is when actors who are very very successful, and they get a platform, instead of accepting the award gracefully and walking off. They have to make a political statement. Yeah. Now, politics is a very emotive thing. Politics is a very sensitive thing. And if you say the wrong word, like if I mentioned, say, Trump, and you mentioned Biden, and if I Trump for Trump and champion him, and you champion for Biden, people look at me as that. Not that I do. I'm just giving quotations. You I know, know that you're just that I'm was just an arbitrary you an example. That was just you an know, arbitrary that, example. They they label you as a certain person, or you know, you're woke, you're racist. You know, 
and it's completely ballyhoo because you're entitled to an opinion whether sure. you're red or blue, Democrat, Republican, you know. But I say to myself, you know, when you get up on that stand and you've got that talent to express yourself on screen and you win an Oscar and you go up there and thank you, Mum, thank you to, to the Academy and everyone else and me agent, just walk off the stage and say thank you. <laughs> You know, it's the greatest you, thing to do that. Thank you for the award. That I, thank you for the paycheck. Well, thank, I mean, thank that, you for the mansion. Once, once you get once you get that statuette, that's yeah. that's the, that's the uh, that's the keys ticket to, the to go anywhere you like in Hollywood. That's the keys to the castle. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know. That's right. I would do. I would be grateful than that, and I've always maintained that. Other than being a London cabbie where my job is affected, I won't really make many political views because people look different to you then rather than if you don't agree with their politics. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so if, if you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, reverse it. And I said to you about this and that and that, and we could argue and people are getting killed over arguments that really they haven't got the power. Does that make sense? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Well, it's only an opinion. <laughs> if anyone's looking at this, it's only my opinion. I'm sorry if I've offended you. I don't think so. I don't think you've offended anybody. Um, well, you know, this has been pretty great because I thought we were just going to probably spend a lot more time talking about the origins of how you, but anybody could kind of go, and for instance, people could go to Tony Walker, the Up series dot com right correct which is your website and they can read yep. all about your career you're yeah. not only are you a subject of this 60 year close to 60 year project called the ups yeah. but you are in, you are in a, a cab you're a cabbie but you're also an actor i've done two films over the last three years one was called night bus and the other one's called 90 minutes plus um I'm up for free adverts uh, commercials at the present time now. I've done video uh, castings over the, um, the phone. self tape and, um, and, you know, various other things I've been in, you know. So you if you're watching, you should, and you need a British, uh, like a, an English uh, character, here's your, here's your guy. If you're watching and you want, I would hire you. You're well, charismatic. Yeah. You're uh, super, I mean, you're, you're engaging. You know, you're a warm guy and very well learned and read, obviously. Well, I think so. I mean, you yeah. know, I've got a little bit of history in my head and uh, yeah. passion. So that, you know, all those things make good actors, I think. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things that touch the uh, emotions and the, um, the, the, the the characteristics out of you. But, and you've got to have experience that you've experienced all that. And um, I've had a learned life and I've had a, a very blessed life you know mm -hmm. and um, that's the way i see it but i love new york i love new york people i love the hustle and bustle and the five six times that i've been there they've always made me feel so welcome that whenever i'll come back again they always say tony's in town tony come and have <laughs> dinner well, you know and uh, i'm it's, I'm it's only great... sorry I missed you that time that you were at the first run features office with 56 because I, I, I can't, I can't remember the exact way everything played out, but I can't imagine that if they had told me that you were doing press, that I would have, that I would have said, you know, anything, but yes, please. But I had heard you were there. Maybe you were in the office and I just passed you by and I, who can remember it was, it's like nine years well, ago. Seymour Wishman, yeah. remember Seymour, sure. a, a, an absolute gentleman. What he did, laid out two minutes, and what he done. I just got to open the door for my daughter. One second. I understand. Of course, please do. I'm back. Right, and what he what he done? You know, he, I went into the office. He gave me cups of coffee. We had a lovely chat. He gave the secretary to take me to dinner and um, he gave me various, all them, see them videos you got there? 
Mm -hmm. He gave me about six of them, about 10 posters. You know, he couldn't have been more generous. And, um, you know, every time I go back to New York now, I go up to the, um, the offices of the first run pictures and um, I always sort of have a conversation and shoot the breeze there. And he's always happy to see me. Oh, I'm sure. Um, let's hope they're there next time you go. Uh, well, I'm still getting my emails from the first run, so uh, they're still 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 plowing ahead. Uh, Mention me, they will like, give you more. You I mention. sure will. Yeah, well, you I'm friendly with the, the public. One of the publicists I still am in touch with. A couple of people that I knew really well have left a while ago, but okay, uh, yeah, but. Um, I have made as many trips to the UK and they have the same experience. Always felt so welcome and everybody's been fantastic. Anytime I've ever gone to the UK. And I started going in the, uh, oh, I, I think the late 80s was my first trip. Really? Well, I went to New York in 25 years ago, but I'm 65 now. So whatever, what would that be? Are you five? Years ago? 40. Yeah. Yeah. When? You were 40? I was 40. Mm -hmm. And um, first thing I'd done, mm -hmm. we had tickets to see Phantom of the Opera. Now you're six hours behind, yes? So all of a sudden, I go, to Battery, Park, I go to Battery Park, I buy five t-shirts, I saw all the guys dancing and swinging around. We got on the ferry over to the Statue of Liberty, and at that time you could go right to the very top for the crown, to the crown, yeah? Yeah. yeah. I went up there, I looked at it like it was gigantic, the Hudson there. It was fantastic. Sure. I came back, went to uh, dinner. I think it was either Carnegie's. That was my first with a pastrami wine. They were that big. They call them and overstuffed. We, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, overstuffed and we sandwich. Drinking. Then we went to the Phantom of the Opera. And as I got in there, I sat in the seat and I went to sleep because the jet lag. I tried to do everything in one day. <laughs> I mean, that's why I went up the Empire State Building. I mean, I've done everything in 10 minutes. Right. I, I walked all along Broadway, looking at the shops, looking at the buildings, looking at um, Studio City, the lights, the um, fantastic for me, you know? Sure. It was that vibrancy there. And uh, I tell you, I'll never forget that. And I, I got up the next day, I walked from Madison Avenue, all the way down to Broadway to Times Square. Mm. I wanted to suck it in. I wanted to suck every street. I wanted to suck the, the road signs, the crossings, walk, don't walk, the green lights, the red lights. You know, it was like a cauldron of streets and avenues. And me and being a London cabbie, seeing the yellow cabs and, you know, and listening to the hooters, uh, uh, baby, you know, fantastic the vibrancy yeah. there you know it was sure. great yeah and um i just wanted the humble i just wanted like a donut and a cup of coffee and there was like a donut stand with a cup of coffee in i'm not saying so silly but i was sort of like on broadway yeah. watching the cabs go by and just taking it in drinking a I cup of coffee thinking i'm here yeah I'm you're, here, you're, like, you know? right no i can understand that i can understand it i even as a lifelong New Yorker, I don't lose sight of that, of that, how, how, how uh, important New York is to so many people. I, I, I understand. The um, last time I came, the last time I came here, I went to the Dakota and uh, I went into uh, the entrance where they wouldn't let me in. And I said a prayer outside for John Lennon and Yoko yeah. Ono and his family. Then I went <clears throat> over to, um, the, the park. Strawberry fields. Went to strawberry fields. I saw Imagine. And again, I said a prayer for him there. And, uh, you know, these are the things that I always take away from America, you know. And um, I just watched, for me... And I just watched last night, finally, after a month, I think it's been out for a while, the trailer for Peter Jackson's documentary that he's doing on Let It Be. This The footage looks uh, just unbelievable of them you know what he did what, what it shows is that uh much um uh, opposing the general perception that 
those guys weren't getting along at the end, that they were at kind of at odds. But the film shows four very cl- good friends who were well, who clearly still loved each other, even though they were they were beginning they were coming apart as a band, but they still had a great amount of affection. I know effect. Paul. I know Paul lost lost a lot of his soul when John died. He, yeah, he was really really emotionally distraught, and uh, the two of them are like. Simon and Garfunkel. I know Paul Simon sort of wrote the music and he sang the songs, but once they joined together, they're like just two two legs. They walk together. You know what I'm saying? Right. And uh, to say that Paul wasn't, you know, lost his soulmate was, you know, that he, he's never been the same since. I don't think in his songwriting. Really, yeah. You know, because they bounced off each and other. So no, and it was so personal. There was no way he was going to be able to present himself publicly and succeed. Like, you know, they, they went after him when when John Lennon died. They kind of made him the fall guy for a while. You yeah, know? but, you know, I mean, you had Al, was it Alan Klein in them days turning everyone's head? You know, Alan Klein, you know what I'm on about? Yeah, yeah. And, and Paul McCartney had East, Linda Eastman, uh, yeah. his, her family fighting one. And Alan Klein was fighting the other. If I'm right, I could be wrong. I'm just giving. Yeah, I think I'm right. But um, and it was a, the acrimony then. You know, it's, it, the bit of pill was in. But then time is the greatest healer. They love one another. There's no doubt about it. They love one another. Yeah. And, they, and and he still he still reflects on his voice. He still reflects on his voice being next to him. And you know what would John say in this moment? And he'd pick up. And um, there's a quote in Hey Jude, you know the song? Well, I, the movement well, forward and back, but the movement know. you need is on my show, shoulder. Yeah. And Paul McCartney often said, We're gonna write that. Shall I and John said, no, no, leave it in, leave that in. And even now, when I listen to that, the movement it is on your shoulder. I listen to that lyric, and I can see John and Paul nodding to one another in my head. That's the image they've created for me, you know? And that was about John Lennon's son, Julian, at the time. Right. So that's how much Paul McCartney must have felt right. about his dear family. And great, great, great song. I love the Beatles. Me too, yeah. Um, not not the most controversial statement we can make, but I love the Beatles too. Um, I, I'm supposed to uh, go with shortly... Uh, but I feel like we barely scraped the surface, Tony. I don't know what to do about it. But um, I mean, you know, um, this has been for me such a treat because, as I already told you, from a very young age, I was fell in love with uh, Michael Apted and this project. And what a gift to be able to be here with you now. And, you know, uh, I appreciate your being giving me this gift in a way to be able to do something uh, for my listeners and the people that like what I do, you know, a much smaller audience than the Up series, but I'm really happy that I can give them uh, this conversation. They can hear it and get to know well, you. Well, listen, I'm, I'm just a normal guy on the street. I'm no better, I'm no worse. I just love a long huh? cab. I don't know. And I, I talk know. to a lot of people, but I love New Yorkers. I'd love to come back. I've done an assembly where I could sit down in front of an auditorium of the Q&A we could have. We could have a family atmosphere with no inhibitions from me to you. You can say whatever you like and I'll put you all at ease. But if I got an invitation to come back to New York, I would love to come. You made me feel so loved and welcome the last time. And I'll just always ring the bell for New Yorkers because I love them. Well, then you got to come back. I will certainly will. We'll, we'll get well, thanks for this, this opportunity to talk to you. And uh, anyone who listens to this, I wish you all well, happiness, and God bless you all. And most of all, as Ronald Reagan would say, God bless America. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tony. You got it. No, just win it for the Gipper. <laughs> One for the Gipper. One more to give me. <laughs> All right, let's stay in touch though, because we have a lot in common. All right, listen, nice talking to you. Same. I, I take I doff my cap to you, and thank you very much. God bless you all. I'm going back to now watch some soccer. 
All right, enjoy. And you we call it soccer. We call it football, yeah. but we can. Up the can... Spurs, Tottenham. That's my team. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you.